Uh, this morning we have a very exciting talk by Dr. Nicola Prastu of the University of Edinburgh. Nicola Prastu got his degree in biology in Cagliari, Sardinia, where he also obtained his PhD in the genetic determinants of baldness. His research has been focused in understanding the genetic constituents of complex traits. After moving to Trieste for his postdoc, he got involved in the genetics of taste, food preference, and food choice, which has become his main research interest. He is now a Chancellor's Fellow at the Usher Institute of the University of Edinburgh, where he is working on different projects spanning from genetics of food choice and consumption to the biological causes of complex diseases. Today, he will be discussing some very interesting links between our genes and our diet. And with that, I will hand the floor over to him. Please give Dr. Prastu a big warm welcome. Well, thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Nicola Pirastu, and I'm from Sardinia. Now, for those of you who don't know, Sardinia is this big island here, right next to Italy. Now, sorry? No, sorry. I don't know if you can move this. Okay. Um, so this is, it's very famous because it has very beautiful sea and beaches, but this is not all of it. So this is what it, you know, the internal looks like. Now this may look familiar. These are dolmens. And we have lots of sheep, of course, and these big rock castles, which are very ancient, from 2000, 2500 BC. Right? So it's been an island, it's really isolated, like Orkney, and it's very famous for uh, studying genetics. Okay? Now, when everyone thinks of genetics, at least my friends, I think this is what they think I'm doing. Uh, I'm manipulating DNA to one thing, to get superheroes, probably. <laughs> but, in truth, this is more what it looks like, so it's not so exciting as <laughs> doing superheroes. And medias don't help because this is the message we're getting out, right? So this is a commercial, so you can go online and do a test to see if you have the adventure gene. Of course, then you can buy their car. <laughs> and even, even companies like, can I say Marmite? If you go on their website, you can do a test to see if you like it, right? So if you don't know, if you taste it and you don't know, then you can have your DNA tell them. Right? But in truth, it's more like this. So, just a brief overview. So, your DNA is your genetic code. Is you know, the, it's the build, it's the instructions which make you, and it's divided in 23 pair of chromosomes. It's like this, and each chromosome is a very long DNA molecule constituted of only four bases, okay, four letters. Now, of these, we have three million, three billion. Okay, divided into chromosomes, and just we know about a hundred points, hundred million points, where they are different. Okay, so each of these genetic variants, since you have two copies of each chromosome, can have two, three different states. Okay, so you can have if this is C and T, you can have B either C C, C T, and T T. Okay, now what happens is that let's say you want to study people's height, okay? What we do, we collect a large number of people, not like this, it's more in the order of 100,000 or 500,000 or a million, and then what we do, we divide them in each different state, each different uh, version of the variant, and we see if there's a trend, see? So these people are much shorter than this, okay? This, this is what we do, and we just do it lots of time, okay? So we do it 25 million times, and what you get is a plot which looks like this, which looks like Manhattan, okay? So each one of this is actually called a Manhattan plot, seriously. Okay? And each one of these dots, it's one of those variants we were talking about, and the height gives us an estimate of how strong the correlation is, okay? So this is how we find genes. Now, when I had to study, decide what to study, I, I wanted to study something which could have an impact in the world. I didn't want to study 
the genetics of migration of storks, for example, or you know, other stuff. I wanted something which would change people's lives, okay? Now this plot is from, it's called the Global Burden of Disease. So here is how many years of life in the world are lost because of these risk factors. So this is smoking, for example. So as you can see, smoking is accountable for about 100 million years of life lost in the world, okay? And this is the change in the last 25 years. Now, as you can see, this is how important they are, and this is the change. We've been quite successful, right? So all the important ones have gone down. With one exception, which is this one, obesity. So despite the fact that it's really important, so it's responsible for the loss of 100 million years of life, in the last 25 years, we've not been able to do anything about it. And the reason, I think, is because the approach has been eat less and move more. And this is 50 years ago. And if you talk to a nutritionist today, he will tell you the same thing after 50 years. Okay? Now, when we think of obesity, it's actually more complex than just to not eat and to not move, and move more. Okay? And it has, you know, it has to do with your physiology, so how your body works. It has to do, of course, with physical activity, food consumption, and, of course, psychology. So if you're sad, you're going to eat more, right? Remember Bridget Jones eating ice cream because she was sad. Uh, but also your environment is very important. And genetics has focused a lot on this part, so how your body works. But we know from recent studies that it's actually a much broader thing. So genetics is involved not only in how your body works, but also how much you exercise, right? Or your psychology, so your personality traits are influenced by biology. And of course, my thing is I focused on food consumption, okay? So I wanted to understand what, what genes are driving your food choices, okay? And the reason is that through this, I can, we can understand how your body is telling you what to eat, but also we can establish what you should be eating. Okay? So many of the, 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 of the messages which are coming from the nutritionists are really going one way one day, one day the other. So I don't know if you heard, but last year someone came out and said, oh, if you eat lots of cheese, you're going to live longer. And what? <laughs> but they were very convinced, and all the headlines were like that. And we've been told not to eat fat for our life, and now we can eat fat, and we cannot eat sugar anymore. So, this is, it's not their fault, because it's very complicated, but genetics can help a lot. And of course the idea is to, you know, find new foods or which will help you eat better, but also to understand what the public should be saying, okay? Now, when we think of food consumption, this is the way it's measured, okay? So, they ask you these really complicated questions, like, how often do you eat dried fruits, such as prunes or raisins, and it goes from never to two, two or more times a day? Or they would ask you, over the last 12 months, did you eat peaches, nectaries or plums? And if you say yes, how many times did you eat it when they were in season? Now, how many of you know when it's plum season? I have no clue. But also then, if you answer, you know, then you're going to go here and you're going to answer when they're not in season, okay? So we take this very precise measure, and then after we've done this, we change it into these things. So you take this really precise measure, okay, so you take a plum, and you transform it into carbohydrates, fats, and so on, and then you keep going, okay? So you, you do your fat from food and health, and, you know, the relationship with your metabolites, and also to understand the genes, okay? The problem is that when we do this, we have a huge issue, because this is what 20 grams of protein in 100 grams of food look like, okay? So it's a steak. This is exactly the same amount of protein, or beans, or cheese. So these three foods, once we do this process, get reduced to the same amount of protein so we cannot make anything out of it, okay? And then there's another issue, which is, this is a standard drink, okay? So this is 12 ounces, you know, this is what a glass should be measured. But of course, when you're home, 
you know. I mean, <laughs> everyone's got their own idea of science, right? So this is absolutely unmeasurable, okay? <laughs> now, there is this. So, given that we have no problems with food availability, the main thing which is driving people's food consumption is food preferences, okay? So you're gonna eat what you like, and you're certainly not gonna eat what you don't like, okay? So this is a survey done in the US, and as you can see, these are what people find important in the US when they choose their food. And as you can see, taste, which is not just taste, but it's flavor, is the first thing. Everyone thinks flavor is important, and price not so much, okay? And then, of course, no one really cares about the environment, but you know, <laughs> someone else would care at some point, okay? Now, so instead of measuring food this way, the way I do it is I just ask people, how much do you like, for example, red wine from one to nine, or, you know, just on this one, okay? So that's easy, because you know what you like, you can answer, but if I ask you how many times have you drunk red wine in the last ten years, you have no clue. So that's why I focus on food preferences and taste, because it's so much easier and so much more reliable. Okay, so when we think of food liking, food liking is a very complex thing. Okay, so we're always thinking in terms of taste, but actually it's not just taste, it's there's color, right? So if I give you a blue hamburger, would you eat it? <coughs> Probably not. And the sound, right? So if the apple, when you, when you bite the apple, it doesn't crunch you think it's spoiled, probably. It should, it should make some noise, right? And also the texture and the smell and so on. And all of these are determined by both your genetic background but also, you know, the exposure you've been. So, if you grew up th seeing blue hamburgers, that will be the color you're, you're going to expect, okay? So, when we think of, when we studied twins, we know that, more or less, there is the genetic component for this is quite strong. So it goes from 78% to more or less 20% for sweet. Of course, everyone likes sweet. Okay? Now, there is one question no one ever thinks of. So why do we have food preferences? What are food preferences for? Okay? To understand this, I'm going to use this guy. So you know who this is, right? This is a vampire. And a vampire eats only blood. Okay, so the vampire does not need food preferences. He can eat only blood. Think about a vampire who doesn't like blood. <laughs> you know, it's going to have a horrible life because that's all he's going to eat. In fact, vampire bats do not have any taste receptor or olfactory receptors because they don't need them. They only drink blood. But for people, the story is much different because we can eat anything, right? So, you've seen kids, they put anything in their mouth and they will eat it. You have to be very careful. So, what, so think about this is a caveman and he's walking around the, the forest, right? And he comes by these two berries. Now, they both look the same, they're both red, right? But one is poisonous and one is not. So, how is he going to tell which one he should eat? Because if he's wrong, he's going to die, okay? So, that's what taste is for, okay? So if he eats this, this is cranberries, it's going to taste sweet, and so there's energy. But if this is bitter, you'll probably spit it out and will never taste it again. Okay, so taste is uh, avoiding for you to uh, get poisoned. Okay, so you have to remember that for a long time, we didn't have supermarkets, we were wandering in the forest looking for berries to eat, and we had to find a way to inform our body what we could eat. Okay? So this is... So this is the taste that exists, that we know of, it's only five. Uh, sweet, well you know all sweet, uh, it's just to understand where energy is. And then we have umami. Uh, umami, no one knows umami. Uh, umami is the taste of um, chicken broth, for example. It's glutamate, okay? So it's savory, okay? But it's important because there's a specific receptor for this. and it tells us where proteins are, okay? Then we have salty, and salty is good to a certain extent, so we like it, and if it's too much, you won't like it, it becomes bitter. And then, of course, we have bitter and acidic. And bitter is telling about the poison, while acidic is usually telling us about spoiled food, okay? 
anything. So spoiled food will be really acidic. And these are just, don't worry about too much, but we know which the sweet, umami, and bitter receptor are, while we have no clue about salt or acidic. Okay? Now, the meaning <coughs> is that basically if you eat something which is sweet or has umami in it, it will tell you to eat it. Okay? So it's energy. While for bitter and acidic, it's poison not to eat. Okay? So don't eat it. The problem with this and obesity is that, of course, this is what sweet and umami tastes like, <laughs> and this is bitter and acidic. So you're programmed to eat this, but this is what's making us sick, right? Okay, so to understand how much this is inborn, it's not learned. These are babies, just newborn baby, who has never even tasted their mother's milk, okay? So this, you can do this only in the US, no one in Europe would ever <laughs> give approval for this, okay? And they gave them sweet solution, and he's smiling, well, if you give him bitter solution, he will react very strongly with strong disgust. And this is not just humans, this is the reaction of uh, a mouse and a chimp to sweet, but this is the reaction to bitterness, so you don't like it, okay? And in fact, uh, you probably, okay, so this is, wait, sorry. So as you can see, this is baby sitting lemons, <laughs> and I, I highly like that, so they are not liking it, and they have not been trained, they know they are not liking it, it's not pleasant. <laughs> okay, so what's going on here is this, so if you eat something sweet, some of these, your tongue will send to your brain this, you know, this information and your hunger goes up and your pleasure center turn up, right? So that's how your body tells you to do something, it gives you pleasure. Uh, well, if this happens, it will go to here, but you feel no hunger and no pleasure. Okay? So that's, that's why it's so hard to live off just salad, although it's so healthy, and you have to put you have to take some of these and, you know, you put butter or, you know, salad dressing and salt over it because you cannot just eat, you know, something which has no calories, okay? Now, this worked very well when this is how we used to get food, okay? But, of course, now this is how we get food, right? So, <laughs> so we have a huge problem, a huge environment. Okay, so... Um, there are two main approaches to this, to studying this. Okay, so this is the really reductionist oh, sorry, uh, way to do it. So you have a gene which codes for a taste or olfactory receptor, which changes a specific perception, and then it gives you your food preferences. So this is how scientists have looked at it so much. Okay, um, to the point that okay, so this is basically this is the same babies eating. You know, lemon again, but look at this guy. Look. He loves it. <laughs> right? So what's what's different between these two guys? That's what people scientists have been trying to do. What's the difference between them? Because he's really enjoying it and he's not. Okay, so this is the way this is a paper from 2010, and this is the way they looked at it. So let's say you have a sandwich and you have onion, which is a sucrose, so this is your sucrose receptor, and then tomatoes, lots of glutamate, um, and then you have this, which has, it's bitter, and this is, has an isovaleric acid and androstenone, so it's two compounds, right? So, according to them, depending on your genotype, so if you have your sweet receptors and your money receptor working, and your bitter receptor not working, then you're going to love this sandwich, and otherwise you're going to hate it, okay? So this is how people have been looking at this, okay? So we'll just start from this one, which is the sweet receptor, okay? Now the sweet receptor is actually composed of two different uh, proteins. One is called T1R2, and the other one is T1R3, okay? Now, what, what they found is that there is this variant, these two variants in um, this T1 
T1R3 receptor, which changes how strongly you can perceive sweetness. Okay, so they gave everyone the same amount of sweetness, and they asked how strong it is. And as you can see, these people, these CC people, actually feel it much stronger. This is how you read it. So these are feeling it's really, really strong compared to these guys. Okay, so this is not making you perceive sweetness as sweet as these other people. Okay. What happened is that if you look at the uh, preferred amount of sucrose in a solution, it works very well. So these people who are perceiving it very strongly need much less sugar in solution than, um, than, they, they, than these people because they're not feeling the same thing. So if you start arguing with someone, is this sweet, is this not sweet? Remember that you have no clue what they're feeling, and it's a personal experience. You cannot argue about it. It's just really personal. Now, it's very interesting because this is for mothers. You can see it's very clear that depending on their genotype, they're going to like different amount of sweetness. But if you take children, no way. Children just like you know spoonfuls of sugar. I have two young children, and they would eat sugar with a spoonful. So during your life, it changes. But for children. They're, you know, this genotype is not doing anything, and probably because they need energy, they're growing. Okay? What happens is that if we look at the distribution around the world, it's very different. Right? So in Europe, this is the, the one which makes you very sensitive to sweetness, and this is the one which makes you almost insensitive to it. It's very common in Europe, so everyone in Europe feels a certain amount of sweetness, but if you go to Africa, it's actually the opposite. Okay, so there, there's so when, when they develop products or you know when you if you want to act on it, then you have to consider also this part. So how much is it spread in the population a certain allele which will give you high sweetness? The problem with this is that when we look at this, this is the gene we just talked about, which changes your sweet perception and it changes the amount of sweetness you feel, but then this is actually the one which is associated to sugar consumption and this is actually associated also to the number of dental caries you get. So it's actually associated to how much sugar you're eating. So it's much more complicated because it's not just sweet perception which is giving this sugar consumption. Something's going on here which changes this. Okay? Now, let's talk about this. This is a very famous gene. It's a bitter uh, receptor. So it's what lets you, allows you to feel bitterness. Um, we know there are 25 genes which code for bitter receptors. Okay. So we have one sweet receptor and we have 25 bitter receptors. That's how important it is not to get poisoned. Right? So you can live off without eating so much, but if you eat the wrong thing, you're going to die. Right? And so what happened is that this guy went around the world and had, well, England mostly, and had everyone tasting this compound and he divided the population in tasters and non tasters. Okay? So, what we're going to do now is a small experiment. So, I've brought this uh, taste with me, and you're, most of you will receive one, some of you. Okay, so, just hold it. And we're going to repeat the experiment, so I'll have you taste it, and we'll see what happens, okay? Just... Yes, so don't put it in your mouth yet. Wait for it. We're all going to do it together, otherwise you'll swallow it with a surprise, right? <laughs> So not, not such a good reaction. Okay. Just... One minute. Okay, so do most people have one? Or where are we at? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is wait, when I say go, you're gonna put it on your tongue. Okay? Don't swallow it. Well if you swallow it, it's just paper, okay, so you nothing will happen. It's not poisonous. And you have to hold it until I say so, okay? If you can. <laughs> okay, so one, 
these, these guys that don't have a okay. time to figure it out. We're almost there. There's not enough for everything. Yeah, don't wait. <laughs> don't worry, it's not poisonous, I promise. <laughs> Usually. <laughs> okay. Okay, so. One, two, three, taste it. Okay, just wait. Okay. So you can close your mouth if you want, it's fine. Okay? So, how many people taste bitterness? Okay? And how many people just tasted paper? Didn't taste anything? Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a huge, that's interesting. <laughs> we have lots of non-tasters. And how, for how many people it was so strong, it was almost unbearable? No, no way. Okay. So, usually, no one. Okay, that's very interesting. Usually, for some people, this, this bitterness is so strong, it's the strongest feeling they've ever had in their life. <laughs> Apart from pregnant, I mean, giving birth. But, and that's, that's a different story. But, but apart from that, it's still, it's still the strongest thing. Now, this thing is... It, it works like this. So non-tasters are not, it's like colors, right? So non-tasters are not feeling anything, just paper. They're blind to this. Okay, then there's people, most of you, well, some of you are tasters, so feel it normally. And super tasters, which for some reasons there's none in Orkney, apparently. <laughs> Never happened. You're the only population in the world, trust me. <laughs> okay, even Indians have some super tasters. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really strong, it's really blinding, right? So, we know that there is a gene, which has been discovered in 2003 in Sardinia, actually, which has just this two form, which is called AVI, which is non-functional, and PAV, okay? So people who, well, most of you have this variant here, are AVI, AVI, so both the copies of your gene are non-working, so you're producing only non-working receptors. So you're blind to this compound, okay? Now what happens is that this is how people usually look at it, right? So if you're ABI, ABI, you're going to be a non-taster, like you guys. Then if you are heterozygous, you're going to be a medium taster. And you know, if, you're, if you have all, you know, most receptors working, or all of them, then you're going to be a super taster, okay? Now, the problem with this, this is a very simple way to look at it. The problem is that there is another gene which is changing how many taste papillas you have on your tongue. Right? So I could, well, we're not going to do that today, but if you want, you can go home, buy some blue dye colorant, there's instructions on the BBC website, and you can actually count how many taste papillas you have. And as you can see, these guys have so many, much more of these guys than these guys, okay? The other thing that happens is that um, it depends also on how we found out in 2013 that it depends also on how many of these receptors you have for each taste bud. Okay? So we started out with a very simple phenotype, which was bitterness, and then you know a gene which controlled it, but then it became very complicated. Okay? And this is just bitterness. Now the other interesting thing is that when you look at so we said bitterness is bad, right? And vegetables are bad for you, you know, it's bitter, so it's, it's bad. Okay, so what do you think super tasters who feel bitterness so strong are going to eat? Anyone? Are they going to eat more or less vegetables? Less, right? Well, unfortunately, it's actually the opposite. So, they're actually eating much more. Okay, so these vegetables, and these are the super tasters, and they're eating 4.5 servings against 3.7, much more. And this is done in the lab, but when we look at the population, so these are populations from Central Asia, and this is how many super tasters there are, so you're certainly not Armenian, <laughs> they have 40% super tasters, and as you can see, and this is percentage of calories dependent on vegetables, population-wise, as you can see, the more vegetables corresponds, the more super tasters corresponds to more vegetable liking. Even though it's bitterness, 
they're bitter, they're still even more. Probably because they're not feeling just bitterness stronger, but they're feeling everything stronger. And usually, the vegetables are, have a milder taste. <coughs> but it's very interesting that you can see this population-wise, and probably uh, the fact that you have many super tasters is that because you have many more vegetables to taste and many more ways to get killed by poisoning yourself. Okay. Then, when we look at consumption, we don't see an association of the gene we just discussed, which is what you would expect with uh, vegetables, but it associates to salt. So, if you add or not salt to food, which we don't know the meaning, but it's not what we were expecting, honestly. Okay. So, people who are ADI, ADI, like all of you, apparently, are adding are more likely to add salt to food okay, than other people. Okay, so this is another example. So this is a study we've done a few years ago. And there is this gene, it's called TASCOR43. And we've seen that it's associated with coffee liking. Okay? So as in the example before, there is a working version and a non-working version, and people who are who have two copies of the working version of the of this gene are actually liking coffee more. So they feel more bitterness, right? So they have a stronger bitter perception, but they have a higher liking. Okay. So then we thought, what in coffee could be doing that? So we tasted caffeine. And this is caffeine, so as you can see, people with this genotype here, with two copies of the working version of the gene, are perceiving caffeine more bitter. Okay? So, this, so these people are actually feeling more bitterness, and they're liking coffee more. So what do you think is going on here? It's, it's just backwards from what we learned, right? Well, I'll use this guy here. Uh, I need, actually need to, to press play. It's a video. Okay, so this is your first reaction to coffee, probably. Okay, so you drink it, and it's more or less like this. Okay? And what? Why? Because coffee is bitter. It's hot. It's really hot, and it's astringent. So it, it will like uh, how do you call it? Tie your mouth. It's really like not smooth, right? But then what happens is that can you press play? Again? Sorry. <laughs> I was not expecting to not be able to get, okay? So then, <laughs> so after the bitterness comes the pleasure. So what happens is that, of course, caffeine kicks in, and then you feel you know, more awake, stronger, and pleasure pleasant. Thing is that your brain does not remember this thing separate, but it remembers only one thing, okay? So your brain does not remember coffee as all these different things separated. That's you have to think about it, but it remembers it as one thing. So if you keep at it, you'll be able to actually like coffee because of this. So you're conditioning yourself to like coffee. Okay? And that's, that works. So what you can do, you can cover bitterness with sugar, but once the link is made, then you can stop putting sugar. So everyone starts drinking coffee with sugar or milk, and in time you can reduce it. To the point, well, not everyone. I, I put sugar in my lunch, okay? I use, still use sugar, but many people, no one starts with black decaffeinated coffee and keeps going, okay? <laughs> to the point that even people who are drinking decaffeinated coffee are still drinking it to look for caffeine, okay? And that's, if you think about, have you ever drank a bad coffee in your life? Did you just taste it and leave it there? No. Well, maybe some of you, but usually people will finish it. That's why in restaurants they don't give great coffee, because you're going to drink it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and they know that. <laughs> and companies can take a lot of money. Okay. okay, so going, so this is, so we've seen that this taste approach, this molecule approach works so so. It does work, but it doesn't work as we expected, so it's hard to make predictions. So the next step is, of course, we thought, okay, so let's just forget about this. Let's just go directly to the problem. Okay, so we, we went and studied directly food preferences. Okay, so forget about taste. So what we did, we traveled around the world a lot. So this is Italy, so this is where I started. 
and we collected samples in here. We had a strong collaboration with Netherlands. And then we went on the Silk Road, literally, we didn't go there, by car. And we collected samples along the Silk Road everywhere. Okay, so to understand, this is, uh, this is what it looks like. Okay? So this is how far we went to collect the samples. Don't ask me why we went to. It's a long story. But this is more or less what it looks like. Okay? So we went there and we asked everyone, so this is me asking people how much they like uh, food. Of course, it wasn't easy because they were speaking Uzbek and I was speaking Italian. <laughs> we, had, we had some interesting translation problems where Clover was translating small monkey at some point. So that, that didn't work out perfect, but we did in the end. And so what we did is that we found many genes which are associated to, not to, uh, how can I say, not to like bitter foods or you know, fatty foods, but to very specific, um, to very specific foods. So we have three, four artichokes, for example. Well, probably here it wouldn't work. I'm not sure how many artichokes you guys eat. But then we have one for oil or butter or bread, which I'll talk about now. And we have also some for white wine. Okay, so not bitterness, not sweetness, but real foods. Okay. Now, uh, this is what. Uh, remember the Manhattan plot. If you zoom it in really, 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 really close, and we look just a little piece of DNA, this is what it looks like. Okay. So we have this variant here. I forget about the name, but it's in this B and. BPNT1 gene. Okay. Now, what this gene does, it's it's not very much known, but it what hap what what it does is that you know lithium, which bipolar people would would take, works by inhibiting this gene. Okay. And this gene is expressed in this area here, which is called nucleus accumbens. Sorry, I have to every once in a while use these weird names, um, which is associated to liking. Okay. So, what happens is that this area of your brain, which is here, this is waist circumference, and this is how much it activates if I give you sucrose. So, what happens is that if I give sucrose to obese people, this area here is activating less. And it's, it's, it's about liking. So, people, <coughs> probably obese people, are not feeling the same pleasure in sucrose as other people are feeling. And that's probably why they're eating more. Because you always need to reach a certain threshold of pleasure to get satisfied, right? So if I get less from food, then I'm going to have to eat much more to get to the same level someone else is. But this is really important information because, of course, it's not a problem of taste, it's not a problem of willpower, it's not a problem of hunger. It's a problem of how much pleasure I'm getting to food from food. And this is really important because it changes the way we, we act on it, right? So we need to find some pill or something to restore, to get these people here getting this same experience from food, so they'll eat less, okay? And as you can see, this is the, the thing which um, lowers your liking to oil, oil or butter or bread, these people who are getting more pleasure probably are also eating less calories and they're eating less starch and saturated fat, so they're, they're actually eating less oil or butter or bread, more or less. Okay? So that's just to understand why is it so complex to act on obesity, because it's really difficult and we're not having the correct approach to it. But I guess this is going in the right direction, I think. Okay, so this is another example. This, this is a, the, the, the example, this is the same plot I've shown before. Uh, how much time? 10 minutes. 20. 20, okay, great. So I'm on time. So this is this gene here, it's called HLA-DOA, and it's, it's not, so don't, don't focus too much on this, but it's not what you think. This is an immune system gene, okay? So this is a gene which regulates your immune system. It doesn't have to do with taste or hunger or satiety. Now it's interesting because what it does is that it regulates the whole system basically. And the other thing is that it's been shown 
that is so every every one of you has this HLA type, and and it's very variable and it's very different. Okay? Now it's been shown that women do tend to choose someone whose uh, whose immune system is different from theirs. Okay, and the way they've done it, it's a bit disgusting. So they they took some college students in the US and they had them smelling sweaty t-shirts from men. Okay. <laughs> They're completely, I mean, it's a bit hard. And then, see, if they actually lay type, so the immune system was different from theirs, they liked it. I, I, I can't believe this, but they did. And if it was the same, they didn't like it, okay? Now, from a biological point of view, this has a strong meaning, because you know, your immune system is protecting you from uh, from out the outside world, you know, from bacteria and viruses and so on. So the more different, the more responses you can give, right? But this goes through smell. So the idea is that this this gene is affecting how you um, how you like through smell white wine. So it's using the same system you're using to choose your mate. And it's, 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 we find it associated to white wine and to some extent to red wine, okay? Now when we looked at it, we've seen that this is women, so this is the effect on women. We've seen that in men, this thing did not have any effect, basically, which fits with the experiment of the t-shirts, okay? So, <laughs> when we look just at men, okay. That something happened. Okay. When we look just as men, we found this other gene here, which is had been associated before to, which is this, which has been associated before to binge drinking. Okay. So this is telling us that men and women, for food, are different also from a genetic point of view. So it's not just you know what your your it's also your biology which makes you different. And that's again important to understand who's gonna need to eat what. Okay. This the interesting thing is that this gene actually so we went at looking at actual consumption in these two populations and we seen the same exact effect. So the genes which predict which are associated to liking in men then actually predict their consumption of wine. Okay. So in conclusion, I think that food preferences are a good way to understand nutrition. So they're, they're a shortcut <coughs> to understand nutrition. They don't have the same biases. And of course, I think that these studies will be very important to understand how to act on obesity and how to change people's diets. So we're not, we need, before we start changing people's diets, we need to understand how to change them, what to change and what to target. The willpower thing is not working, okay? So if you can't stop eating, it's not because you don't have willpower. You can have willpower for a long time, then 24 hours a day, and then in half an hour you can empty out your fridge. So it's not, it's not lack of willpower, it's because you're made to eat calories because you're supposed to protect yourself from potential you know, lack of food. Okay, so, and we need to target, it's not just hunger, but there's lots about pleasure. So people don't eat just to fill their hunger. Otherwise you could eat carrots and you'd be fine. But it's not gonna work like that, right? Not so much, okay? So I think that these studies will permit us really to change public policies and also the approach to visiting and potentially uh, improve everyone's life.